Welcome to the Tech Trends Podcast, where we discuss the latest manufacturing, technology, research, and news. Today's episode is sponsored by the MT Forecast Conference. I am Ramia Lloyd, producer, and I'm here with... Stephen Lamarca, AMT's technology analyst. And I am Benjamin Moses, director of technology. Steve? Senior director of technology. Don't yeah. try to hide yeah. that you're getting old. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking about that. The selfies I take now, I have to worry about my hairline. <laughs> I love your selfies. <laughs> I want to take selfies like you. They're I my try. favorite thing. Like they're intentful. I be, but he, it's the, it's the fact that you're so methodical <laughs> about like every time you go on a trip, you it's like you're documenting it for work reasons. Like <laughs> I am actually at this event <laughs> and on time. <laughs> Here's my no smile mugshot <laughs> in front of said of event. I love them, and ben, it's like like we should all really be doing them. It's it's my verification of my uh, expense report. <laughs> it's, like, it's like is this a major industry event? AMT was here <laughs> exactly. If you didn't see us, that's your fault. We're here on LinkedIn. Ben's our, our favorite content creator. <laughs> <laughs> One of the most reliable and consistent for sure. True. This comes from years of training. <laughs> Steve, let's talk about our travel. Yeah, we've gone on. I heard you were in Tennessee. Was on Tennessee. Before that, I, I, you know, so before going to Oak Ridge, Mm -hmm. um, which was last week, the week before that, for like nine days straight, I was in the Outer Banks with with Melissa and uh, my best friend, and you know, we were just just vacation. Nice. you know, nice solid excuse to be like, like, oh, we left, with, we left the dog with my mom. Yep. Zero responsibilities. It was just <laughs> like s- probably seven, realistically, seven days straight of just being inebriated and sandy. <laughs> a good vacation. Um, just a proper vacation. Yeah, exactly. And at the end of it, we were just like, oh my god. Well, hold on. Well, before I talk about the end of it, um, let me talk about. I, I did take some notes. Yeah. Um, when you go on vacation. And you want breakfast because let's be honest, most of the time you're not going to get a breakfast on vacation. The reason is only psychopaths and serial killers wake up early on vacation for breakfast <laughs> or nine year olds. So yeah, <laughs> if you have kids, sorry, you know, but like we were like on the day we left, we were like, let's get breakfast today sure. because we got up early to leave. Yep. Um, let's, let's have one last nice moment. And oh, I Googled where a nice breakfast spot was in the area Every place was like packed because sure. when you go in and out of the outer banks, like the rental properties are all scheduled the same way. So it's a mass exodus. Right. And then it's a mass influx of people coming in to, like, to fill the houses. Like the movie Jaws. I guess. <laughs> I don't, I've never seen the movie. I'm going to have to watch it now. I know. Shame on me. No, it's fine. So mass exodus, but we're like, yeah, we're not, we're not going to be one of these nerds in traffic. <laughs> Let's go get some breakfast. Well, like 50% of the people also <laughs> thought that way. So the good, the, there was a good breakfast joint that we were thinking about going to. And then Melissa was like, let's not spend too much money. We've spent a lot on this vacation. Yeah. Um, and then I'm like, all right, you know, so I found like a cheap place with good rating, like low dollar sign, high stars. Sure. And they had no view, and the breakfast was like mid at best, oh, like man. not even good, like quality diner food. Where sure. they know the food's not good, but at least they they tweak it by putting like a stick of butter in it, <laughs> like not even that. And I just thought to myself, you know, when in doubt, when you're struggling to find a like a breakfast place, yep. and you're up for breakfast. Go, Just go, go to McDonald's. <laughs> it's consistent. It's reliable. Yeah. It is always. It doesn't matter if you're in. Like Tahiti <laughs> or in the Outer Banks, like every there, it's always the same. McDonald's is always good about like it's not like Bojangles where one in five locations <laughs> is going to have awesome food right. and four of them are going to be utter trash and they're just going to throw the food at you. Yep. All McDonald's are always the same. Always the same. Always should have done that. I'll that comp- was- to add that, I recommend a Cracker Barrel breakfast. <gasps> That's fire you're, too. That's you're good. right. Mi- Cracker Barrel is like, it, it's definitely the ultra premium luxury McDonald's. My my family, uh, like I think my aunt and uncle were so proud. So like they have the truffle farm out in, uh, um, I can't remember, you know, deep woods of Virginia. Um, they have a truffle farm out there and they've got a really nice farmhouse. Um, and I think it's in Berryville. No, it's not in Berryville. It's Percival. Um they were so excited. Like, they've got all this nice stuff out there. It's a right. very nice farmhouse. 
appointed with, you know, nice luxury goods and whatnot. <laughs> but, like, the one thing that they were the most proud of, they bought, like, two Cracker Barrel rocking chairs for the front wow. deck. Wow. Yeah. And they're nice. They're a nice right. place to Sounds pass good. out. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, let's talk about Oak Ridge. <laughs> no, hold on, hold on. One more. Last, like, like, like I got, I got three more things right. on, on, on the Outer Banks. Yeah. Number one, we survived a tropical storm. Oh yeah, that's right. Tropical storm, Adalia came through there. Yeah. It was terrifying. Me and my best friend Chuck's, his mother, Gerilyn, we were up all night. Like we were just watching the storm. We were watching the water and the sand hit like the windows on like the fourth floor of this rental house yep. we're in. And it's like, we're not that's sleeping tonight. So and, and this was after we Melissa and I rented scooters yep. and like you know signed all the documents saying that like if any damage happens to it you're covering <laughs> yeah. it and these things are getting like beat once up the <laughs> once the storm it was still going on but yeah. once it was like not deadly right. out there I went outside to like pick up M- Mel's fell over because he had a littler one yeah and I it I picked it up dummy I should have moved it like into like. Like a, uh, a, a protected yeah. kind of area. Didn't think to do that. Nope. I just put it back on the kickstand <laughs> that it had fallen down from in the first place. So it fell down like one or two more times sure. after that. Brake lever breaks off. Oh, no. Um, fortunately, the place was cool. But that segues into talking about Melissa and I rented scooters, these wild hogs, like <laughs> like, like these these absolute, you know, just just the epic example of what motorcycling perfection looks like. Uh, not. Um, <laughs> these were like these Chinese wolf scooters. Mm-hmm. And we're like, I don't know what we're getting into, but I don't know if I trust my life. Like, I don't know if I trust my life with this. And I'll do like three digits on like the highway <laughs> on a Kawasaki. Yep. But this thing, I don't know where it came from. I've never heard of wolf before. <laughs> um, and plus, I'd never been on a 50cc scooter before. Yeah. Yep. I appreciate slow vehicles. Okay. Like the slower the, the, the car or motorcycle, the more you can put it, like ride it around, drive it around at 10 tenths. Feel like, you know, Fernando Alonso all the time. <laughs> 50 cc's and me being like, you know, a couple 10 pounds shy of like 300. <laughs> 50 cc's is not enough. I finally found out like what is too slow. 50 so, Too though. slow does exist. Yeah. And 50 cc's is like a weed whacker trying to move <laughs> me. Um, That's fun. And then well, my last thing, have you ever been to a, a rental property or an Airbnb or a hotel room that has a smart TV? This sure. place had multiple smart TVs. Right. And one of the apps on the smart TV is Netflix, of course. Right. And the people before you stayed logged in. Sure. Mm-hmm. All right. Here's where I differ from everybody else. Because I feel like everybody else would be like, yeah, just use the account. They're already logged in. Who cares? Me being, I feel like a kind of nice person. I'm like, no, I don't want to screw up their algorithm. Yeah. Because you know, I don't want to start watching things that are vastly different from like you know, an 11 year old princess's like Barbie <laughs> movies and stuff. And I'm gonna create a new account or a new profile sure. on this person's account. That's nice. And just so they know that it doesn't belong to this family. Right. I named the profile Mr. Stupidy Head. <laughs> <laughs> and so we had like one nice night of like watching shows and movies. Right. And then the next morning. They booted you out. You've been logged out. <laughs> logged back in. I was like, well, at least they know now. Now they know. You know? That's good. Good. I appreciate that. So I feel good about that. I feel like I did something good. Yeah. Yeah. Because we have a ton of profiles at home. So I've got an account just for the home stuff because we yeah. watch a lot of YouTube. I watch a lot of YouTube. And so does Amelia. But there's an account just for that. And then we have our own separate accounts that we cast to the TV. Right. To your point is, I don't want the same history or recommendations that Amelia or Deepa get on their channels. Yeah. And I feel like there's also a lot of people who probably have a Netflix account with a profile that says guest. Yeah. That's just inviting people to use your account <laughs> when you like go exactly. to a rental property. Yeah. So yeah. that's a that's a Look out for Mr. Stupidy Head. You know I've been there. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Worldwide stupid so, head. All right. The end of the vacation, yep. we leave um, the entire like six hour drive back. It's normally a four hour drive, but it was a mass exodus that yep. I added two hours to the drive. But traffic honestly wasn't that bad, other than everybody else trying to leave the Outer Banks. We're, Melissa and I are just like talking on the way back home. And we're just like, I don't, I don't know if we can go back to work. 
<laughs> like this was too much fun. We didn't have to walk the dog ever. And as yeah. much as we love him and we miss him and we want to go back to him, like there was no, it felt so nice to have zero responsibility. Yep. How are we going to do this? Fortunately, our boy Tom Feldhausen <laughs> at Oak Ridge National Lab was like, hey, Steve, can you MC this event? Never emceed anything before. Yeah. Can you MC this event at Oak Ridge National Lab? Never been to Oak Ridge National Labs before. And um, it was the best transition to come back to the office nice. because, yeah, I was like, I don't, I'm not going to go back to the office. I can't do it. <laughs> I, I can't get back to work. I don't, I'm not thinking about manufacturing at all right now. And it was just a nice, like, it, Oak Ridge National Lab, I think um, um, on my post on LinkedIn, uh, Stephanie Hendrickson of Gardner Business Media yep. and Additive Manufacturing Media, um, she um, she commented on the post. It's like Oak Ridge National Labs is like the Disneyland of all <laughs> things additive and manufacturing in general. Yeah. And she's exactly right. Yep. It is. It's Epcot Center for sure. Yeah. Um, but. Um, Oak Ridge was a real blast. I've got some more notes on there because I want to make sure I cover everything. Um, so I was there for a hybrid manufacturing systems workshop specifically to focus on what are some of the bottlenecks holding back hybrid manufacturing in the production manufacturing industry today. Yeah. So a lot of the people there were – People that Tom Feldhausen and uh, the the gentleman at Oak Ridge National Lab who put it on, Blaine Fillingham, um, both PhDs, by the way. Everybody there is like a PhD. <laughs> uh, at least almost everybody there is a PhD. Um, and they, they put on this incredible event. But, like, all the people were there were people that, like, Tom knew on a first-name basis mm -hmm. that are using hybrid manufacturing technology. Gotcha. And it was just a workshop, like I said, to, to – target the pain points to des well to identify the pain points before Oak Ridge can target them and help industry leaders figure out what is stopping them. So like Okuma and Mazak were there to find out the two biggest hybrid manufacturing machine producers um, that make, that make dedicated hybrid right. manufacturing machines. Um, of course, uh, a gentleman from Meltio was mm -hmm. there. I think there may have been like a team of people from Meltio sure. and Jason Jones from Hybrid Manufacturing Technology made sure to get pictures of their machines, <laughs> yep. of which Tom gave me a little bit of hell for because <laughs> he was like, you took a picture of a Haas with a Hybrid Manufacturing uh, Technologies Ambit in right. the uh, spindle. I was like, yeah, that's an awesome way to rich retrofit a CNC machine yep. to do 3D printing. It's the perfect example of hybrid. And then you, you also took a picture of a tour, one of our tour mocks <laughs> with a Meltio, like, like a uh, 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 three uh, additive tool yeah, in yeah. it. And I was like, well, yeah, you're, you know, your dumpiest machines do the most impressive work. If you look at a million dollar Mazak or Okuma hybrid machine yeah. and it does something, you'll be like, Ooh, ah, it did like, its job. <laughs> it did. It's, it did what it's supposed to do. Right. But right. then when you take something like the lowest budget CNC machines and they're doing hybrid manufacturing, hybrid metal additive, yeah. it's like, that's cool. That's why I took pictures of that. I stuff, do like so. the idea of retrofitting equipment. That's, past end of life yes. to continue their life. I, I do agree that, okay, if like... Like you want dedicated at some point. Yes. But but it's like, you know, one of the first product demos that I ever saw that really blew my mind was um, Matt Block of Royal Products. Yeah. I think he's still at Royal Products. Did a demonstration <laughs> of a bar puller. Right. And I was like, what? what is a bar puller? Like it's... It's such a stupid sounding thing. It's it's just a tool sure. that goes in a, a CNC lathe and ha it's a gripper yep. to pull the bar stock through the chuck yep. of the main spindle um, to, to, to expose more material to cut away. Right. And he's like, yeah, you know, it's nothing special, but you buy a few of these for your machines, one per machine. Yep. And, you know, these are a couple hundred dollars. Compare that to you know, a couple tens of thousands of dollars or a hundred thousand dollars for a bar feeder, like right. a high end bar feeder. Right. And, you know, you can put off that expense, make a little bit more profit so you can 
then afford the bar puller. It's just a transitional piece yeah. of technology. Yep. And that's exactly what these hybrid retrofitting tools are. Yeah. These additive, like like that uh, the Ambit and Meltio. Um, and, and that's why I think the industry, the actual production industry, hasn't fully adopted additive yet. And I've got a reason why. But, yeah, um, before we move on, I, I do like that term, transitional technology, because I do like the idea of... so. One of the, things, the problems that we see uh, in a lot of the road mappings uh, event that we participate in, the challenge is always understanding the risk mm -hmm. and understanding return on investment. Yeah. So being able to use these transitional technologies to say, okay, let's invest $5,000, let's say, and test something out. Yeah. That way we can figure out, do we want to invest in a $50,000 uh, machine later? That's you know, that path, and similar to like the test bed that we have, you know, being able to do these small investments to say, yeah, this thing could be worth it. Right. And let's quantify that worth through these transitional yeah. technologies. I think that's and, a And I don't think, approach. you know, Jason Jones's ambit is as inexpensive as like a bar puller. Sure, sure. But it's, it's inexpensive enough that a small or medium-sized job shop can acquire one. Right. If they don't like it, they can always be like, we didn't like it. Jason Jones... Probably wouldn't comp them, but it would be like, we'll buy it back for you at a sure. reduced price because we need to refurbish it. Right. And then it will be sold to another person. But right. like, you know, I'm sure there's a deal that can be can be done through there. And that's that's the that's the item that you want to buy before you go to an Okuma or a Mazak hybrid machine. Right. right. One would think. I mean, I don't I don't know. I don't run one of these shops, but that's what I would think, because it's like major investment. Um but it was really refreshing going to this event and seeing how much hybrid machines are actually being used. Right. A couple takeaways that I got from the event is um, the mach major machine tool companies, again, Okuma, Mazak, Haas probably, um, Tormac. Tormac is all over the research area. Okay. Like, That's good. like they, they're, you can't miss them at NIST. They're yeah. at Oak Ridge National Labs. They're at Georgia Tech. They're everywhere. Anybody is doing anything for any kind of research. Their machines are on a, and in a lot been, of uh, test facilities, yeah, research facilities. Yeah. Yeah. They, they are like, you know, I don't want to – I don't mean this to be offensive, but like they were kind of like a laughing stock when I started in this yeah. – when I started at sure. AMT. And now they're like – they're staying at like the same price, right. but now they have a pedigree. It's yeah. really cool what they've done. Their transformation has um, been interesting. And they're really open to everything. So I, what a cool company. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you wouldn't have caught me saying that like five years ago. <laughs> um, but uh, let me let me check, go back here. I do have questions. Sure. On, I heard there's a nozzle you're playing with. Okay. <laughs> a hypersonic Let's, nozzle. Tell me more about before it. Before we get into like the fun stuff, okay. I just my final closing thought here that I heard from a lot of the people that 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 were voicing not concerns, but like, you know, bottlenecks again, pain points. Um the people that are using hybrid when they are trying to train somebody yep. and or talk to their higher ups about acquiring the next machine. Mm -hmm. They've all said, can we please call it something other than additive? Wow. Let's avoid the words additive in 3d printing sure. because it's scaring people off. Okay. Like my boss who signs off on machine tool acquisitions, if he hears a hybrid machine or an additive machine or 3d printing, he thinks, Oh man, that's a million dollar machine that we're going to have to hire two PhDs to run right. or else it'll just collect dust, be overhead and take up. Tailoring terms or definitions to very specific uh, technology adoption profiles. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. Um, and just the last bit. So you touched on or you wanted to I wanted poke to the bear about the, the <laughs> nose cone or not nose cone. I'm sorry. So one of the things that Oak Ridge National Labs and, and, and the Tom Feldhausen does with all his you know, degrees and, <laughs> and, and security clearances. Um, they do a lot of the manufacturing for the research that goes into uh, the U.S.'s knowledge of hypersonics. Sure. And one of the, you know, the, the, the homecoming queen parts that they had on display there <laughs> was um, a 3D printed, well, hybrid manufactured um rocket nozzle mm -hmm. for a hypersonic missile. Cool. Like this is quarter million dollar part sure. made with some made with multi million dollar machines 
uh, that expensive. was made by a bunch of PhD researchers. <laughs> yeah. Very expensive, very <laughs> impressive part, like yep. incredible. And I saw this and got to get up close to it when we were on one of like the plenty of tours sure. during this workshop. Like the first tour we go on, I see this rocket nozzle and I'm, I have to have an empty water bottle in my <laughs> hand. And like, I just go to my group and was like, this is pretty cool, right? Yeah. You know, like what an impressive piece. And I just take, oh man, don't need this anymore. <laughs> and I toss it in the rock, the, the nozzle, like it's a waste bin. <laughs> it got no laughs. <laughs> it got zero laughs. And then to add insult to injury, I reach in there. Yeah. I can't reach it. <laughs> <Too deep. laughs> this nozzle is huge, so I couldn't get it out. And the next tour group is coming by, and they're like, why, why are you reaching in there? It's like, I dropped, I dropped my water bottle. <laughs> and, and this nice guy, uh, Brad from Hyper Mill, which I have another story. We might have to save that for another we'll podcast. That. But Brad's like, oh, no, 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 don't. You could ruin your jacket. Like, that's a sharp edge right there. And, and he's pretty tall and, right, and like, right. lanky. So he goes in and is like, that's stay in there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so there is like a Walmart water bottle, a disposable water bottle in, you know, a hypersonic that's pretty good. Rocket nozzle at Oak Ridge National Labs, and it's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> please, please have me back next year. All right, RIP water bottle. <laughs> yeah. Steve, do you want to share your hijinks with Tom, or do you want to save that for next episode? Oh yeah. So I have I pride myself in having never sent a accidental text that was supposed to go to your significant other, right? To somebody other than your significant other. Sure. And sure enough. <laughs> I sent my my morning good morning love. You know how are you feeling today? You know I'm, I'm looking forward to another great day of at Oak Ridge National Lab. Thought I send it to Melissa. Nope. Went to Tom. <laughs> <laughs> and and fortunately, this was at like seven thirty in the morning. Yep. Nobody else like like the the that day didn't start until nine o'clock. Sure. Nobody else is in the conference room yet. He's in another room, which which really close by, but right. another room, uh, like making mixing his coffee. And a couple seconds later, after sending that, I hear, "Aw, thanks, hun. <laughs> I'm glad you're feeling better." And I'm like, "Oh uh, no, <laughs> oh no!" But first, the, first time for everything. There's a first time for everything, and it's not, at least it wasn't like a nude, or a, you know. <laughs> nobody wants those, believe me. That's a rough one. Um, sending a seven in the morning, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But then, but then, okay. So this was on a Thursday morning, Friday. I'm back home, sure. you know, getting ready for the weekend. I'm not doing anything. I didn't. I worked from home that day because, uh, you know, we're covering from work travel and vacation travel. And I get a text at almost 11 o'clock from Tom Feldhausen. <laughs> Good morning, love. I feel better today, but a little car sick on the way to Florida. He drove his family <laughs> to uh, Disneyland. That's cool. Disneyland? Yeah. Sure. He, so, I, and I kept it going. I said, feel better, boo-boo face. Miss you. <laughs> so, you know, that's... um. I guess in industry, Tom is my new work wife. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations, Steve. Thanks, I appreciate man. that. <laughs> I was going to talk about Fabtech. Tell we'll me talk, about Fabtech. Let's talk about that another time. Another time? Let's save that for All next right. week. All right. Next time, let's make a note. We'll say Fabtech and my run in with Brad of Hypermill. Oh, yeah. All right. I'm Great notes. guy. I can't wait to talk about him. Brad and Hypermill. And we'll talk about Fabtech, too. One day, 24 hour, 25 hour trips are not fun. Dude, you're wild. That was so <laughs> impressive, though. Did you, uh, did you have a bag? Uh, yeah, I still checked the bag. Okay. Because I was thinking about doing um, like a work event that night and then uh, something else I wanted to change when I got there and stuff. So I had a full bag. I don't, I don't carry all the luggage. I carry knives with me, too. So yeah. I got to check all that <laughs> stuff. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. My favorite thing about like day trips, like, like leaving early in the morning and coming back late at night is you only need one change of clothes. Yeah, yeah. So you don't need to bring a bag if you're not bringing a computer. Right, and if you don't right. bring a bag, it feels like when you walk onto a plane and walk off a plane and walk through the airport with no bags, it feels <laughs> illegal. Uh, like yeah, it's, it's, it's so nice. Yeah. It, yeah. But too yeah. bad. That's right. It was you fun. You should learn the way. Yeah, learn. I, every trip I keep learning. It was fun. Rumiya, can you tell us about today's sponsor? 
Today's sponsor is MT Forecast. MT Forecast brings the latest economic news and industry trends straight to attendees. Industry leaders, executives, and key decision makers will explore an agenda that provides a roadmap to better business strategies through customer industry insights, economic forecasting, and deep dives into market data. For years, MT Forecast speakers have been sharing crucial looks into the near future. Go to amtonline.org slash events to save the date and register. Good job. Thanks, Romeo. This is my favorite read. I like to say, for years. <laughs> <laughs> got to keep them interested. Steve, I, I got... I booked my MT forecast flight yes, yesterday. Thanks. I got two articles. The first one is about generative AI from gameishard.org. Wow. GG. Okay. Is it interesting? It's, so it's from <laughs> NVIDIA. It'd be cool if it was .gg. <laughs> <laughs> so NVIDIA to discuss the impact of generative AI in robotics. So NVIDIA is in robotics. And they do a lot of stuff supporting artificial intelligence, particularly in the hardware, but they have exp- expanded their portfolio, right? So NVIDIA is a big player, huge corporation. Yeah. They do a lot of stuff. And what the article talks about are general concerns about artificial intelligence related to automatic decision-making. So um, one, uh, what is generative AI related to ro- robots? So it's aut- autonomously generating new solutions to adapt to changing environments. So if you have like a big part of bins, yeah. How does a robot know to pick? It's capable of picking things up. So you can kind of, it's learning itself, learning how to pick up things or, you know, it takes a picture of the bin and it says, okay, I can pick this one up, but I know I can't pick this one up. So it kind of makes a decision or learns along the way. So it's, le- it's training itself along the way. And a couple of things that it brings up as potential challenges, and it it's more on the broader scale of artificial intelligence because it talks about ethical considerations. Mm. Which okay. we've been talking about a lot. Yeah. Uh, data privacy. Okay. Uh, algorithm bias. Ooh. And the last one, I'm not so sure, so sold on it, but potential displacement of human workers. Which, if you already talk about automation, that seems like it's a lower point. But yeah. I, I do want to mention that you had me on all of those points except until the last, the last one. one. Yeah. <laughs> That's a bummer. But the other one, I definitely agree with it. You know, there's. Well, the the part bigging part bin picking is kind of small when you look at the full scale of uh, autonomous r- robotics because now you're talking about um, you know using vision systems to kind of understand the scene. Mm-hmm. So when you look at ethical considerations like how do you d- determine like is that a human is that a cat you know there's still a lot of issues on um, classifiers determining you know humans versus other objects and you know back to the data privacy right you're transmitting tons and tons of data to a black box somewhere, right? How do you follow that data and know that it's kind of secure? Yeah. And then, the, you know, the algorithm bias is still, that's still a big thing related to the ethical consideration. So it's, there's a lot going on there. Yeah. Um, what's what's really cool, and I, I don't mean to heart back on the, the trip to Oak Ridge, but in this workshop, there was actually a keynote speaker mm-hmm. who talked about the AI oh. um, and where AI helps most in the human um, brainstorming workflow. Right. Um, it, of course, helps middle management, mm-hmm. like, the most in that position. Um, and to be fair, we've been using AI for quite a while, right? We've been oh, supporting yeah. open AI. And so the position that I've we, we've been supporting is it supports human development. Yeah. Right? And a lot of the use cases that we've found most useful is, just like automation, it helps support humans to produce more, be more effective, be more efficient. It's an extension of right. automation. It is a tool. It is exten- an extension of your yep. capabilities. But just like we talked about uh, using wear wrenches versus Craftsman, Snap-on, if you don't understand that tool and its capabilities, right. you're going to break it. Yeah. And when it breaks, it's going to be a problem. So I think understanding like the limitations of our AI tools, mm-hmm. that's something that doesn't get discussed a lot. Everyone's like, oh, just use chat GPT. Great. No, what are the you got to know how. Exactly. What are its? Li- how do you want to use it in the context of that small boundary to benefit you? I don't think we talk about that enough. No, no. And sure, there are some things. I wonder where the point of diminishing returns is because there's there's some things that like we know not to do right. with with AI platforms, large la- la- uh, large language modules. Mm-hmm. Um, is that what an LLM is? Large natural language models. Yeah, model, not module. Um, and I put this on Do Not Disturb. Um, and the one thing that we learned kind of right away is like, if you need it to summarize an article, mm-hmm. you have to copy and paste copy and paste the text of that article. Um, and you used to have put 
have to put quotations around it. Right. So it knew the range to which to summarize and what not to. Um, and, and like, if you had any other notes, it'd be like, put it in this tone of voice right, or right. something. You had to use quotations, but like, one of the things that we tried to do right off the rip was instead of copying the text, let's just copy the URL. Let's yeah. send it to the website where the article is. The problem that we found out right away with that was it reads the entire website, including advertisements. Yep. And if it can keep scrolling, and if it's one of those websites where if you keep scrolling, it moves on to the next suggested article, Oh yeah, you're in for a <laughs> world of hurt. <laughs> yep. um, and then if you're smart, here, here's if you do this and like if, if anybody's listening and you're like, oh, man, I do that now and you haven't caught on, it's because you're not reading what the AI's output is. Right. Because if you do that and then read the output, like what chat GPT or whoever um, says the summary of the article is, and you you will notice right away that the figures that it like, like numbers and units of measurement mm -hmm. that it puts in there are wildly Wrong, right? And egregious, erroneous, and egregious. <laughs> so, so that, now that is stuff that by the time it becomes more mainstream, which is it is becoming more mainstream right. than than we would like it to be. Um, but when it becomes like Google did in like the '90s and was in <laughs> elementary school computer labs, right? Um, and everybody was using Google. Um, by the time it gets to that point a lot of those problems that we ran into will probably be patched out and so. fixed. But it's still, I feel like it, it, those still belong on a list of best practices. Reread okay. what the output is. <laughs> Trust but verify. Yeah, Always there you there. go. Always there. See, Viana told me about some clever additive technology. Clever additive, okay. I'll tell you about some, uh, 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 a smart move forward yeah. to take a, a smart way to make a take a baby step forward in the development of additive technology yep. and a really dumb way to name it. <laughs> so um, let me find my article. It's from 3dprintingindustry.com. Um, extra, extra 3D launches new 3D printing technology. The second you see that in any headline, immediately go to hit hit the alarm. <laughs> sus, <laughs> new technology. Okay, sure, let's see. Sure. Let's see. Uh, has has uh, extra three D launches new three D printing technology to eliminate SLA and DLP trade offs. Eliminate. Sure. To eliminate. Strong words. Word. Like, 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 if you read that improperly, you have to remember trade-offs at the very end. We're sure. training in that large language model, <laughs> model here. Uh, if you read that wrong, you just read elim to eliminate SLA and DLP. Sure. Stereolithography apparatus. Right. Both of these are vat photopolymerization. You have a vat, a bucket of resin, and light is being shot into it to solidify the resin to make a part. I like your hand motion. <laughs> SLA uses a laser. DLP uses a illuminated like like screen, like an LCD screen, and sure. lights up shapes that you want to solidify in the resin. Yep. Um, and they they say that they've created a new one, an entirely new one, to eliminate both of these. That's crazy. In truth. Ready for the truth? Ready yes. for the hard, yes. the, the crack over the head of the egg of truth? Um, they took both of those technologies and put them in one machine. <laughs> this this is good. a VAT photopolymerization 3D printer yeah. that has a laser and it has uh, um, an LCD screen That's cool. to illuminate light. So, it is cool because you get the speed right. of digital light. Yep. And you get the surface finish and accuracy of laser. Yeah. So you don't have to worry about a slow print with a laser, and you don't have to worry about awful surface finish with the LCD screen with a, with a DLP. Right. They've just put both devices yeah. in the same machine. Little combo, combo machine. It's not new. <laughs> <laughs> They've just made a new kind of hybrid. Um, I saw. That. And then they gave to add insult to injury. They gave it a stupid name. It's called HPS because, you know, got to cater acronyms to the military, the <laughs> DOD. Um, they called it HPS. You know what HPS means? What does that stand for? Hybrid photosynthesis. The, uh, photosynthesis <laughs> is an organic thing that happens in chloroplast, in chlorophyll. Like, there's none of that is part of this. It's not organic at all. This is a machine 
This is that photopolymerization. There's no biology going on in this. I feel like they asked Chat GPT to name it, and they no, didn't check they it. Did. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't check the order. And they just sent it links and didn't read it. <laughs> That's so funny. Axtra 3D, good job, clever, but nobody likes clever. <laughs> Get a new name. Good job. Good job. You did so it. We, they, you got... they eliminated it by combining it? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. exactly. They subtracted by adding. <laughs> oh, it is hybrid. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Break it down. <laughs> Extra. Okay. This is the industry we live in. This is the last. The last article I have is from Composite World. I think you and I agree composites are cool. Composites are tight. Like some carbon fiber. This oh. one talks about um, carbon fiber reinforced plastics. Mm, let's see how far it for large structural for large aircraft structural parts. Okay. So oh, are we talking about fiber placement, bro? We're talking about fiber placement. So we're talking about <laughs> structures the size to support the A three fifty aircraft. Um, this one talks about new ways for collaborative uh, robots to support um, creation of these parts um, using. It's a little spicy. Using carbon reinforced, um, you know, um, uh, woven fabric. Yep. Yeah. And the cool thing, so tape and toe replacement has been around for a little bit. And it is expensive. It's difficult. It's big. You have it's basically a gantry machine yeah. lathe. But on the gantry, there's a robot arm with a end of arm tooling that lays down a fiber tape or toe of carbon fiber. So in this example, uh, they use, for, for scale, they've got robots on a linear axis okay. that's 30 feet long. So fairly long feet, track. Yeah, big machine. And the nice thing, the interesting part about this, they have a human working in close proximity of the robot. So the human is, uh, the robot is supporting the human as they're placing the, uh, um, the material. So for long cuts of four meters in length, the robot holds the material above the mold, giving the worker just the right amount of material hmm. uh, to allow the curvature. For shorter pieces, the robot holds the material on various spots, uh, pressing tightly on the surface mold, uh, providing the seed points for correct manual draping. So this sounds like less expensive, but more complex fiber tape toe placement. Yes. The Russians are going to be all over it. <laughs> I really like this because we've been talking about uh, chain, modifying the definition of what we consider collaborative robots to mm -hmm. collaborative operations. That's this, cool. is, this is very supportive. And, you know, there's always a concern about uh, automation, you know, replacing humans. This is literally humans working with robots. What more could do you this want? This is as collaborative for? as it gets. So that was a fantastic I article, and so I think far. I think this type of concept uh, has a lot more ex potential expansion co in connection with Fabtech. So, you know, a lot of the industry events that we go to is making a specific part, a one mm -hmm. part. But when we scale that up, the part always has to go into an assembly, and this yeah. is you know an assembly at this point. So how do I put pieces together? How do I hold that? It, some of that could be automated, but at some point, a human is probably involved screwing things together, welding, forming, joining, gluing things. So one scenario I see growing quite a bit is how do we present the part to the human in an effective manner for them to be fast, efficient, and reduce stress on human fatigue? Right. Um, and I think we'll see a lot more growing use cases for that. Now, do you want to buy a $100,000 robot to hold a bike in the correct orientation for you so you can work on the floor. Maybe not, but if maybe... If you sell $10,000 bikes, yeah. Yeah, or maybe holding a transmission so a human can, mm -hmm. you know, install the sensitive parts um, that you need. So I, I think there's a lot more potential, and what we're seeing is the reduction in cost of certain robots and the uh, increasing capability. So the, between that intersection and the ability of, hey, let's test this out on a, you know... $15,000 robot and see if it works and then buy something that's going to last longer back to the transitional technology. So I think we're at a very interesting crossroads where we could see a lot of more interesting use cases for that. Yeah, this is awesome. And I, I, I appreciate it because it's bringing fiber placement back into the spotlight that it really never had. It's not Agreed. popular, but it's such a cool technology. Agreed. It's also untouchable in terms of its pricing. Yes. Yeah. Like, like this is like I was talking about like million dollar machines for hybrid <laughs> fiber placement machines are tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars They're big. per machine. I think there's like nine in existence in the U S uh, depend on the scale. Yeah. And they're all in like research or Boeing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. So, Oh, depending on the use case too. So if they're military use cases, yeah. then it gets tough. 
uh, you know, getting access to that. But I agree, it, they're yeah. used on like large barrels of uh, fuselages. So, if this technology is viable, or if this method of techno Im implementing technology is viable, I think it will bring more popularity and publicity to fiber placement, like dedicated fiber placement machines. Yep. And maybe bring their costs down because there's going to be they're going to be with the more demand they're going to need to supply it more. So immediately yeah. there's going to be a price spike. Um, but then it might come down. There's certainly going to be more people inquiring I about think so. it. And I, but I, it, if robots are good enough, like like your off the shelf robot is right. good enough to do work like this, it's going to go against what I said. And I think it might <laughs> actually increase the prices of robots. It could be. Uh, and. There's two benefits to this. One, you know, what's the return on investment? I see a lot of operational throughput increase. So mm -hmm. instead of having a human do everything, right, having the robot support it, so you're getting a faster output. And then the next operation is, can we incorporate some type of inspection, automated inspection as part of this? So there's a lot of opportunity to kind of increase the throughput of um, these parts. Yeah. So cool. A lot of good articles. This was awesome. Great episode. Ramia, where can they find more info about us? amtonline.org slash resources. Bing bong. Like, share, subscribe. Bye, everyone. <laughs>